Yes, Mr Dinelli. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the next witness will be Mr Clive Richard Van Horen, uh, and I might invite my learned friend, Mr Sherry, to uh, deal with his evidence in chief. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr, uh, Van, Mr. Horen, Van Horen, can you come back in? Uh, you uh, have already been, I can't remember whether it was sworn or affirmed, sworn, sworn and that oath still persists. Thank you. Yes, Mr Sherry. Mr Van Horen, what is your full name? Clive Richard Van Horen. And your business address? Is uh, 1 Harbour Street, Sydney. And have you made a statement in relation to rubric 315? Yes, I have. And um, Commissioner, it's CBA.9000.0042.0001. And it's dated the 15th of May. Mr Van Horen, do you have a copy there? I do. I understand that you... Well, could you look at Exhibit 6, capital A, first of all, please? Sure. That's a letter to ASIC. That's right. And there's a reference towards the foot of the page to something, some topic? Yes. What's the topic? Uh, you said at the foot of the page, you mean at the head of the page? That, isn't it... The second uh, last paragraph. On page three, yeah. So there's a reference at the bottom of page three. Uh, it says CBA will also review the remediation programs across SBOs and BODs holistically to determine whether it remains satisfied that the remediation undertaken has been adequate. Could you look, sir, at paragraph 75 of this statement? Yes. And that deals with a customer rem remediation program? That's right. Is that the one that's referred to in the letter to ASIC? Yes, that is. And what do you wish to say about that remediation program? Uh, simply that since preparing the statement, uh, we've made the decision to align the way we did the two remediations. I'm sure we'll come to the details of that later. Um, so we will apply the same approach that we used in the BODS remediation to the SBO remediation. And there's a one matter of certain fees that were not covered that we will cover. So that decision has been made to adapt the remediation, so extend the remediation. With that additional evidence, are the contents of this statement true and correct? They are. We tender the... Oh, you also received a summons, didn't you, Mr Van Horen? I did. Um, Commissioner, we tender both documents, the summons and uh, the Exhibit 3.41 will be the summons to Mr Van Horen. Exhibit 3.42 will be the statement of 15 May 18 concerning rubric 3-15. And Mr Van Horen, did you also make a statement in relation to rubric 316? Yes, I did. And is that dated the 14th of May? Yes. And does that have the ID CBA 9000.0040.0001? That's right. And that comprises 28 pages? Correct. And are the contents of that statement true and correct, they are. sir? Um, Commissioner, we tender that statement. Give a 3.43 three statement of Mr. Van Horen, 14 May 18, uh, relating to rubric 3 16. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Donnelly. Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon, Mr. Van Horen. You've given evidence before to this Commission that your present role at CBA is Executive General Manager Retail Products, is that right? Still right, yes. And you've held this role since May 2016? Correct. Uh, and you were in that role during the period uh, described as the uh, overdraft account misconduct? Uh, yeah, there, there were two phases to that. Yes. The second the, phase, yes. The latter one. Yes. Thank you. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions relating to business overdraft products offered by CBA. Uh, and I understand that there are two different um, business overdraft products. Can you explain to the Commissioner, please, the nature of those two products? Sure. So, uh, simply, an overdraft is um, a facility which allows a customer to, um, uh, for their balance to go into debit, meaning spend more money than they have available of their own. Um, so, a very traditional feature in the banking world. Um, we have two products and if convenient we can use the acronyms. So the business overdraft or BOD is what you would think of as your traditional business overdraft product. Um, 
that applies to small and all the way up to very large companies or institutions um, with higher credit limits typically and a more um, significant process of originating or creating that overdraft. The second type of product you refer to, Mr. Denlili, is a simple business overdraft or SBO. Um, and that is a product that was developed from 2013 onwards, um, targeting very much the smaller end of the small business area and to try and meet those short-term cash flow volatility needs of small businesses. I see. And the SBO, um, is that uh, part of your responsibility uh, within the bank? Yes. Uh, and you've explained the business overdrafts and that they can be um, higher the amount of the business overdrafts, and that's part of the Institutional Banking and Marketing Division, is that right? Yes, Institutional Banking and Markets Division. Uh, but you're in a position today to answer some questions about what I'll call the double charging of interest to both of those types yes, of Yes, overcharging of interest, yeah. Thank you. Returning to the SBO, you said that it was a, uh, a smaller form of overdraft. Um, what is the maximum limit or the generally the maximum limit for an SBO? The maximum permissible limit is $50,000 for the SBO. Yes, uh, although in, in exceptional circumstances, I understand it can be up to $100,000. Yes, and, right? and I've checked that, and currently we don't have any SBOs above 50000 There could be very rare circumstances where it would be manually assessed by a credit assessor, but to all intents and purposes, the maximum is fifty. Thank you. And is there a minimum for the SBO? Yes, $2,000. Uh, and it's your evidence that CBA uh, commenced developing the SBO to meet business and customer needs in March 2012, is that right? Yeah, that's right. We started with a pilot. Uh, it was officially launched in 2013. I see. And I'll ask you some questions about sure. the changes over time in a moment. Um, when you, uh, or when the bank developed the SBO, you said that it was to meet customer needs. How did you know what those business needs were? Uh, we talk to customers, we hear from customers, um, there's demand from customers for this. Um, it's certainly one of the biggest needs of small businesses is to manage cash flow. You know, revenue is quite volatile typically, expenses can be lumpy. Um, an overdraft facility is a very, very convenient way to manage short-term cash flow needs. Um, well, you would accept though that it depends upon the the relevant business customer, whether or not they uh, would desire a SBO? Yeah, of course. Um, and you'd accept also that, as a reasonable and prudent banker, that you'd have regard, of course, to what a, a business person actually wants um, yes. before giving them an SBO. Um, you explain two pricing components. Can, I, can you explain for the Commissioner the way in which, and I understand they're the same across both the products, but can you explain how the pricing um, of the, the BOD, as you call it, the business overdraft, and the SBO, uh, the simple business overdraft. How does the pricing work? Yeah, there are two main elements to the pricing of an overdraft. The first is paying interest on the drawn down balance yes. at a given interest rate. And the second component is um, a, a limit fee, or think of it as a line fee, which is uh, payable on the limit approved. So I can expand on that if it's helpful. You know, just assume the limit is approved at $20,000. The customer's balance will fluctuate a lot. It could be $5,000 one day, $10,000 the next day, zero the next day. Interest is applied to whatever the balance is. The line fee is applied to the limit, uh, and that's because we hold capital against that full limit. Thank you. And the interest rate that applies to the drawn down amount, what is that interest rate? Uh, for the SBO, during the relevant period, it was 16%. Today, well, for, for a year or more, it's been 14.55. Thank you. For BODs, it varies depending on the customer. It's a little less uh, simple. I see. That, that is a relative, relatively high interest rate. Why is it a higher interest rate than other products that are offered by CBA? Well, relative, um, you know, firstly, it's unsecured. Yes. So it's not relatively high relative to unsec other unsecured products. It's pretty similar. Um, and it's in the middle of the range of typical credit card interest rates, which are also unsecured. Um, it's certainly higher than it would be if it was a secured product. And so the BOD can be a secured or an unsecured product. And if it's secured, typically the interest rate would be lower. And that's a function of, of risk more than anything else. 
in relation to the line fee or the limit fee, um, can I just ask you one further question about that before we pause for lunch? Uh, it's described as a fixed quarterly fee of 1.75% of the overdraft limit. Yes. Is that still the way it is charged? Yes. Um, and is it referred to in some of the documents as a quarterly fee? Is that because the statements are sent quarterly? Um, it's debited to the customer's account quarterly. Yes. So unlike interest, which would it's calculated every single day based on the daily balance, and then interest would be debited once a month, the quarterly line fee is debited quarterly to the customer's account. Are the statements sent quarterly as well? Uh, it depends on the, on the underlying product. Um, to my knowledge, the BTA statement is sent six monthly. Sorry, BTA is the business transaction account. That's the underlying transaction account on which the overdraft applies. Is sent six monthly. Um, and uh, I would need to check this, but I think in some instances, quarterly as well. Thank you. Is that an appropriate time? Yes. We'll we come back at two o'clock, Mr. Van Horen, if we may. Mr. Donnelly. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Van Horen, the SBO has, or the profitability of the SBO for the bank has grown considerably since 2012, has it not? Yes, obviously from a zero base, but yes, it's grown. That's right. In fact, the average balances at the end of the 2013 financial year was only $1.6 million. Million, yep. Yeah. 1.6 million, that's yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah. Uh, the average, uh, or the balances um, now set out in your um, evidence are $124.8 million, is that yes. right? Yes, yeah. And there was, as at 2014, there was approximately 78.3 million in terms of the size limits. Yeah, would you mind just referring me to the relevant, which statement, which paragraph? Yes, if you go to your, uh, what I'll call your first statement. 315. 316. Okay. I think it was first in time. It's exhibit 3.43 at paragraph 65. You said exhibit three? No, paragraph 65. That's it, yep. And the figure that I asked you was, you'll see in average balances. Yep, got it. 1.6, and then I asked uh, FY18, um, 124.8 million, do you That's see right, that? That's right, yeah. Uh, I asked you, and that's not in this material, but it's in other documents, that the portfolio size was 78.3 million in financial year 14. Uh... Is that a figure that... Um, no. Are you talking about balances or limits? I'm talking... Perhaps I'll take you to CBA.0001.0174. Can you explain, please, to the Commissioner what this document is, Mr Van Horen? Sure. So... <coughs> The Executive Risk Committee, which is the body, the forum that received this document, is the, as the name suggests, the uh, committee, subcommittee of the Group Executive Committee focused on risk. So it's the highest risk um, forum. And you're a member of? No. Of uh, the Group Executives typically are a member of that forum. I would sometimes present to that forum around parts of my portfolio. And in fact, if you go to the third page, so point zero four two six, this is a paper that you presented. Yep. Uh, and if I could take you um, specifically, uh, if I may, to point zero four two four. so back to the first page, and in 1.1, 1 .1, if I could enlarge that, it says the SBO portfolio size in limits was 78.3 million in October 2014 and is anticipated to grow to approximately 400 million by 
the end of financial year 17. Yeah, I think that would be right. So there's a difference between a limit and a balance. Yes, yeah. that's right. And in fact, let's explore that difference. The <coughs> limit is uh, the amount, here it's the cumulative amount of all of the SBOs that are someone is capable of drawing down on that. That's right. So a customer may be approved for a limit of $20,000, but Correct. as I said earlier, the actual drawdown would fluctuate at a lower number. Uh, now, at the time that this document was, um, that you wrote this document, it said that it was anticipated to grow to approximately $400 million by the end of financial year 17. Do you know what the figure is now? It's not in your statement. I'm asking you, do you know what the figure is? Um, from memory, our current limits are of the order of $370 million. And I say current, it's around about now. Thank so you. it's lower than whatever that number was. And it's the limits, and you identify that there's a difference between the limits and the balances. It's the limits by which the 1.75% is, right. is calculated. Thank you. So the more limits or the more accounts uh, that exist so as to increase the limits, the more... Uh, the bank receives in terms of the line, the, what you described as the line fee? In terms of gross revenue, yes. Okay. There are obviously costs against that, but yes. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, may I tender that document, please? Exhibit 3.44 will be Executive Risk Committee Memorandum, December 14, CBA 0001 0174 Thank you, Commissioner. Can I take you now to the time, that document can come down, can I take you now to the time when the SBO was introduced and you've given evidence already that there was a pilot program in March 2012, is that right? That's right, yes. And a pre-assessed overdraft facility was offered to uh, approximately 10,000 customers through a mass mail out in March, in, in 2012, is that yep, right? I believe so. And prior to that time, uh, no automated processes have been used for business lending? Uh, maybe not quite correct. You know, there were elements of the business overdraft process that were automated, but I think the key point would be um, the way in which decisioning was done, as in is the limit approved and at what level, was a much more manual process for a BOD than it subsequently became for an SBO. Th that's correct. And you say in your evidence... Uh, if I understand it correctly, that the way in which the methodology was determined was that CBA asked itself a series of questions before it determined that someone was eligible for to receive a, a, right. an offer. One of those questions, and I'll go through each of the criteria that are applied, this is dealt with at paragraph 34 of your statement. One was if the person was aged 18 or above, Yes. Uh, if they were a citizen or a permanent resident of Australia or New Zealand. That's right. Now, was it the case in March 2012 that uh, the person did not currently have a business overdraft? Was that a yes. question? Yes. Yes. And to what about in order to be eligible? Yes. What about if they were a CBA customer for a minimum of 12 months? Yes. So, in I'm not exactly sure I understand your question. Yes, paragraph S F says one of the eligibility criteria was they had to be a CBA customer for a minimum of 12 months. At a later point in time, there was a paper, which I can take you to, which suggests that that was included in March 2013. Do you recall sitting there now when the requirement was, uh, or when the criteria that... No, I, the I, I can't recall that. Okay. Uh, and they m must not have had aggregated commercial credit facilities with an exposure exceeding $1 million, is that That's right? That's right. Um, no, nor be in collection or arrears on any CBA product, is that right? Yes. And then the credit risk so score was to meet a certain threshold, is that right? That's right. So if they satisfied those criteria, they were eligible to be... Um, to be sent an offer, weren't they? Uh, an, an offer would be made available to them, yes, and some customers may proactively come into a branch and apply for an overdraft, in which case they were in that pre-assessed eligible population. They still had to take further steps, which we'll get to, or uh, there could have been direct 
um, contact with the customers saying they were... Can I deal at this point with just the mail-outs that were done? Sure. So if you go to cbas.051700.000.000, this is actually CVH1 to your statement. And this was sent by your colleague, or the now CEO, Mr Common, to various customers. Is that the, is that the letter that was sent out? Yes, this was in the pilot phase. And you didn't ask the person if they wanted an overdraft before, making, before sending this letter, did you? Uh, the, the nature of this is an offer. The customer would still have to take action if they wanted to take up the offer. Uh, and based on the criteria and, and so, that we've gone through... Just a moment. Sorry, sorry, can I just add to that? You said, did we ask them if they uh, wanted this offer? You know, in, in the negative, if a customer had already said they did not want to receive any offers, as in marketing opt-outs, then they would not have received this. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, and as it... During this pilot period, there was no verification of the income or the, the expenses, was there? Correct. Uh, Say, so for example, they had significant liabilities with other banks, for example, you wouldn't know that? Correct. Uh, now, one of the issues that we're exploring in, in this part of the hearing, hearings of the Royal Commission, Mr Van Horen, as you know, are the different obligations and the different regulatory framework for uh, uh, consumer lending business a as compared to business lending. Now, am I right to say that there was a representation made in this letter that a person was entitled to um, an SBO? Uh, it says we'd like to offer you. Correct. I don't think it follows that the customer is entitled to it. Well. Because there were still there were still steps to be taken to take up that offer. Well, that's right, but your but the step that was required by virtue of this letter, as distinct from some of the later uh, yep. criteria, was that if they wanted it, all they had to do was complete the enclosed slip and return it to us in the reply paid envelope. Do you see that at the end yeah, of the letter? Yes, see that. Yeah. Now. You would agree with me that you didn't inquire, you have agreed with me that you didn't inquire beforehand as to the person's requirements or objectives before sending this letter? Um, my interpretation of requirements and objectives, uh, I think, includes what overdraft limit would you like? Well, and that is one of the key um, requirements that a customer needs to specify. And that was something that was still done, to the best of my knowledge. But if they'd been approved for 30, it didn't mean that they wanted 30 or would get 30. No, precisely. But if they, uh, but there was no, <laughs> there was no question asked of these people before they received this letter whether or not they wanted an overdraft or not, was there? Correct. And you would be expected to ask that of a consumer under the National Credit Act that we've dealt with beforehand. Correct. And you would accept that this too was a, what's described in the National Consumer Act as a unconditional representation that the person is entitled to enter into a credit contract? Yeah, I, I couldn't give you a it's sort of a legal answer to that question. Um, I'm just I, asking I, I, you to I, look so, at the document. Yeah. Can you say, say that statement again, please? You would accept that you would accept that this document is a representation that the person is entitled to enter into a credit contract if they so wish with yes. CBA. Commissioner, the document speaks for itself and what's the point of asking the witness what his legal opinion is about what it, what it constitutes or doesn't constitute? Well, I assumed it to be uh, preliminary to something, but uh, uh, go on for a moment. Mr Donnelly, you've heard what Mr Sherry says, uh, which I would have thought... Uh, is difficult to answer. The document either does speak for itself or it doesn't, but uh, I had assumed it to be preliminary to something else. Go on. Yes, thank you, Commissioner.
You recall when we discussed the National Consumer Act on the last occasion that, uh, that under that act, an unconditional representation that the person is entitled to enter into a credit contract can't be made? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. And my question to you is, do you accept that the bank here took an approach that it could not take if the businesses were consumers? Uh, absolutely. So I think it's clear that the, the legal framework, I think we, that's pretty well established, the legal framework that applies to small businesses is different to consumers. And can I take you then to CVH 10 to help the Commission understand why the SBO was introduced? Yep. And that is CBA.0517.0092.0007. Bear with me for a moment. Can you identify this uh, document for the commission? Yes. And what is it, Mr Van Horen? Uh, it's a paper, as the title says, addressed to the business and private bank leadership team, which was the, um, the business unit within the Commonwealth Bank that was looking after um, small and medium enterprises. And the paper was proposing this approach, uh, trying to get endorsement and support to um, create a new way of lending to small businesses that the SBO was, was ultimately... And at paragraph 1.2, it says that it's uh, that simplifying business lending for under $50,000 is a key strategic initiative in the CBA small business strategy. That's right. Uh, and the product to which it refers is over the page, which, as you've already said, is the product we're talking about, the SBO at 4.2. Yep. And that is, the product will be a business overdraft with a simplified risk-adjusted fee structure, the interest rate, 16%, as it was at the time, and a line fee of 1.75%. That's consistent with what you've said before. Correct. 5.1 goes on to explain the requirements of responsible lending. Now, you would accept, of course, that irrespective of the application of the National Consumer Act, the bank must act as a reasonable and, and prudent banker. That's right. And you've said there that prudent lending requires an understanding of a customer's ability to meet repayments. That's right. And traditionally, this is done through the verification of income by means of the customer supplying supporting documentation, such as pay slips and tax returns. Did you see that? Yes. The proposed solution does not include traditional income verification for the following reasons. And then some of those reasons are set out, and it concludes at 5.2.3, the proposed solution will price for increased risk from not verifying income, and the risk-adjusted margin is reflected in the business case. Do you see that? Yep. So, if I understand correctly, the process is that it, this proposal eliminates the requirement for frontline staff to capture, verify and assess income and serviceability. Is that right? It did, yes. And eligibility was to be determined by relying instead on behavioural scores rather than on the verification of amounts. Is that right? Correct. And I can explain what behavioural scores are if you'd like. We'll come to that. We'll come to that. Uh, the, but in proposing the... Uh, the product, a decision has been, uh, or it's put to, the, um, to this group, to the business and private bank leadership team, that there will be a price for increased risk from not verifying income uh, and the risk adjusted margin will be reflected in the business case. Is that right? That's right. And I can expand on that if it's helpful. Can I, sure, keep can I ask you? <coughs> to answer a, a couple more questions, which may give you that opportunity in a moment. Now, this was approved, was it not, as an exception to the normal group credit policy, this particular process? Yes, that's right. So if I can summarise a series of well, where I've got to, the process did not ask 
first whether or not the recipient of the letter wanted an overdraft before it was sent. Uh, as I said earlier, they were open by virtue of not having opted out. Those customers were open to receiving offers. And there was no verification of any figures um, because that was said to be time consuming expenses and expensive. Carry on. And the price was reflected in the higher risk. Sorry, you'll have to answer yes or no. Yes. I think the and higher risk was reflected in the price. Might be. Yeah, I, th I think the, the point I want to make, though, is this is relative to what the traditional way is of doing business overdrafts. So the traditional way would have been a much lower price, but with much higher verification. So, uh, you know, submitting financial statements, bad business activity statements, bad statements and the like. Um, this was by design meant to be a much simpler process, relying on certain uh, bank information, which I think does meet the test of, uh, you know, prudent banker and all of those requirements, because it did look at customers' actual behavior. And we covered this in one of the previous rounds where there's the, the debate is what is more reliable, actual behavior or a customer's papers that give some indication of the future. And, and so that's why I sort of hesitate to say there was no verification at all. Taking you back to that, that point though, but you would accept, would you not, that any of the behavioural scores were only by reference to any material that CBA had at the time? That's right. Sorry. That's right, plus a bureau check. So it did actually look for... for and and you also accept that bureau. by 2016, the process had been, if I can put it in these terms, had been fine-tuned... It had. ...such that you did require Correct. some of that further information. That's right. But at this time, none of that information was required. That's right. And part of that higher risk was because there would be a higher risk that people would suffer hardship because, well, perhaps they didn't really want the product, but having been offered it, accepted it, or having accepted it, could not comply with any repayment obligations. I don't agree with that because if you look at the actual experience, and you use the word hardship, which has a very defined meaning, but if you look at the actual experience of customers who struggle to uh, pay and service their overdrafts, this overdraft um, was not out of line with other products which had different um, origination processes. So um, I don't think it's correct to say that we willingly stepped into a product where we knew that a whole lot of customers were going to default. You know, that's the nature of banking is you take risk. If you knew which customer was going to default, you would never lend to that customer, of course. Well, but am I right to say that when CBA approved the rollout of the product, after the pilot program, so I'm now referring you to the start of 2013, to all CBA um, branches, there were some additional uh, criteria that were applied on and from that time. Uh, are you talking about the 2015 long form rollout? Sorry, I'm not 100% clear. Which, are you talking about still 2013? or are you I'm coming to forward? that, but in 2013, on your yeah. evidence, yeah. one of the changes that came into existence, and I'll take you to paragraph 34 of your statement. Yep. And if you go to point K. Yep. It says there that from that time, one of the criteria was that the person not have more than 70,000 in un unsecured consumer lending exposure. You just That's right, that? yeah. Whereas that wasn't considered as part of the pilot program, was it? No. And as you said earlier, you know, the nature of this thing is you launch a new product. As you build experience, you try and fine tune it and improve it. So this table sets out a number of the changes that we made to improve the product. You also after that time, your correspondence offering these facilities also changed such, such that you offered a conditional approval of an overdraft, didn't you, rather Correct. than, yeah, rather than that, what you'd done during the pilot program? Exactly, and that, that was a change we made right across um, CBA, and I'm guessing our competitors did the same, and this was something that was a subject of discussion with ASIC, with consumer groups, and we were more 
um, shall I say, we, we, we repositioned the way that those offers were made so that it was clearer to the customer that it was conditional on a whole bunch of things happening. And that was after the pilot program? Correct. However. Now, from when it was... When it was rolled out, and I'm now in um, the period after the pilot program, that is from the start of 2013, your evidence is that what was required was that a person who did a short form application, which was required to be uh, done at this time, was required to confirm four things. One is that they, he or she was not an undischarged bankrupt. Yes. Australian permanent resident. Yep. Aged over 18. Yep. And where they were being assisted by someone, that is in a branch, they were asked whether the borrowing for, was for business purposes. Is that right? I believe so, yeah. It was only available in assisted channels in the early days. Uh, and, but before, February 2016, it wasn't a part of CBA's processes to ask about the purposes apart from those circumstances, was it? Uh, you said purpose or eligibility, did you mean? No, I'm asking the, at what point did CBA ask the person what the purpose of the SBO was? I, I don't think we've ever, I might be wrong, but I don't think we've ever asked uh, what's the purpose, as in are you do you want this overdraft to buy a new oven or a motor vehicle or a fridge or whatever? Um, the purpose we've always asked, uh, we certainly asked around what is the limit that you want? And I think it's very difficult in an overdraft product to say that the purpose of the overdraft is because I will need an overdraft in six months time for a specific need, are you with me? It's a very much a fluctuating kind of facility. But, but customers may have, may have wanted the SBO, for example, to service other debts, that is, non-business debts? It's possible, but very unlikely, I would say, because there would be other ways to refinance debt. And for that matter, one of our requirements, uh, if I recall correctly from the very beginning, was that if it was for the purposes of refinancing debt, then an SBO was not appropriate. But if it wasn't until February 2016 that people were actually asked about the purposes, how was it that CBA was able to ascertain whether or not this was the right product for that person? Yeah, I think in the early days, I'm talking about the 2013 period, it, was a, uh, it certainly was a, a simpler origination process, and that was because we were trying to learn of, as to how we could meet the customer needs and uh, as we refreshed the product and you can as you know there's multiple documents going through many many changes we made to the product um, that did include getting more information from customers as well which from a customer point of view is often a negative clearly but from a but you would accept would you not that from a responsible lending perspective that would increase the likelihood that the person is receiving the appropriate product for their needs? It's a complex area. Um, you know, I could make the counter argument, which is that um, the harder you make it for somebody to get access to credit, um, the, we call it negative selection or adverse selection, it'll only be the customers who are in a more difficult position who would go through that really onerous, difficult process to get the credit. If you're a good quality borrower, why would you choose a very difficult path to originate a loan? So this is one of the dilemmas you face. So I, I don't think that's, that it follows from what you've just said. Well, in terms of the ap application itself, the short form didn't ask uh, applicants to provide personal employment information or business or income or expenses, personal assets, none of that material, certainly during the pilot program. Correct. Um, and then later it was done in the long form, wasn't it? Yes. And in fact, the changes that I referred to over time um, that occurred, one of them was that there was a requirement from 2015 in terms of applications on the internet 
and from February 2016 to include a requirement that the business customer declare business revenue and expenses, wasn't there? Yes. And you would accept that by asking that uh, those further questions, there's a higher uh, likelihood that um, the relevant considerations that the bank ought to have regard to in determining whether or not the person should get a small business overdraft is more likely to be answered correctly, isn't it? Um, you know, I think the true test of that would be if you had um, a sufficiently long time period of running the product in the earlier iteration and you could compare that with the newer iteration and you could see what the actual performance and behaviour of those customers were, as in default rates in particular, that would be the best way to answer that question. I can't answer that question definitively because you know, in the early days we were stepping into the product quite carefully and cautiously, fairly low scale, as you know the volumes were quite small. Um, there's nothing we've seen in the default rates that say that it was a materially worse um, <coughs> outcome for customers than it was after the, the changes that we did in 2015-16. Well, one of the changes that you made actually as early as August 2013 was that you asked whether or not a customer was a recipient of a Centrelink benefit. Yeah. So before that, they could have been offered a business overdraft even if they were on a Centrelink benefit, couldn't they? Yeah. And the same happens in the personal s sphere, as you, as you may know, with, um, you know, Centrelink is, uh, caters for a d number of different needs for customers, many of which are secure fairly secure forms of income. And you can't say, sitting here now, whether or not more people that were offered the SBO during the pilot program have encountered difficulties with uh, repayments than those who were subjected to a stricter criteria later on. No, and I, I did include um, default data by year in uh, the statements. I forget which one it was, because um, there were two that overlapped. Yes, I'll I'll come to that. You do you deal with that towards the end of your first statement. I mean, the number of defaults obviously increase over time, but that's obviously a product, <coughs> you would say, and rightly, of the fact that there are more SBOs yeah, in existence. Yeah. But there's been no analysis to determine whether or not the people suffering hardship, and you deal with um, hardship uh, in your statement, are those that were offered the SBO during the period when, if I could put it this way, the lack more lacks. Um, eligibility criteria were applied than the ones in the stricter criteria. Commissioner, some of the questions have talked about hardship and some have talked about default rates. And the witness had said earlier, you need to be careful talking about hardship. There needs to be clarity as to what exactly what our friend is asking. No doubt Mr Van Horen, who is not unused to this process, will tell me if he does not understand the question. So uh, I think it would be helpful to Hardship is a word that in banking means a customer has applied for hardship, which is a defined legal um, process. And uh, when a customer is hard, typically they've lost their job or in, in financial difficulty or maybe a health issue. And then we would try and work with them to put in a place a payment arrangement. Sometimes the debt gets reduced or written off or partially written off. So I would, I would suggest leaving hardship aside because that's a very specific case. If we talk more about a portfolio like this, you worry about your delinquency rate or your default rate. In other words, what proportion of customers fall behind in their payments? Many customers will fall behind in their payments but then make it up because their business tax return for the better or it grows or, or something like that happens. And I think the big picture answer to, to the questions, Mr. Dinelli, is that our view, and it remains my view, is that the, the overall credit performance of the SBO product, whether it's the early days of the pilot through to today, um, with the iterations of our changes to the process, has been very sound. And there's nothing in, in what we've seen in terms of the defaults or the delinquency or the customers experiencing difficulty making their payments that suggests to us any major gap in the way that we originally offered or the customers took up the overdrafts. You I understand it uh, to be the case that during this, uh, during this period in terms of the uh, criteria, you did a, what was described as a deep dive analysis of the relevant criteria. Does that, do you recall that being done? Yeah. 
in March 2016. Yeah, perhaps you could refer me to the document. As yes, I said earlier, so if we I can do call multiple up, deep dives all the time. Yep. If I could call up uh, CBA.0001.0174.1 one one eight nine and specifically if I can take you to a document within this and this uh, that is at point one two one three. This is the, what's described as a deep dive review findings in relation to the full form. And if one goes to point 0.1216, which is the purpose for going to this particular document, you'll see that there is a reference to CBA business liabilities were not being passed through for decisions. This again falsely inflated servicing positions for applications. I'm sorry, it hasn't been called page, up, yeah. Mr Van Horen, but it's 0.1216. So it's the second row. Can you see that? Yep. Now, if I understand that correctly, at this time it was discovered that liabilities weren't properly being passed through the process leading to an inflated servicing position for applications. That is, it appeared that the person could pay more than they actually could. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. And does, does CBA know for ex in relation to that how many applications this issue affected? <laughs> Uh, I honestly couldn't tell you off the top of my head. And, and not Do you, you can't assist increased or decreased or in fact had no effect on the amount of defaults that subsequently occurred? Uh, well, my reading of the documents, and I have to say I don't know the specifics in a huge amount of detail, is that in each case the deep dive identified a problem and unfortunately, that's the nature of, of any kind of business like this. There are always problems that you then need to fix. And the resolution that's, that's referred to here is that um, there was a referral control implemented, which would mean that the, uh, a decision would be referred to a credit assessor, who would then make um, a manual decision, and then a permanent fix was done in March. I'm not sure what the timing was relative to that paper. My question October. to you, my, my question to you, they just focused on the fact, was there any analysis done as to whether or not that issue resulted in increased defaults for people who had been approved for an SBO during that period? I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Uh, can I, uh, if Commissioner, if I could tender that document. Small Business Risk Subcommittee Agenda and accompanying documents 26 May 16, CBA 0001 0174 1189, Exhibit 3.45. Thank you, Commissioner. If I can take you, Mr. Van Horen, to CBA.0001.0332.1047. Now, you're not party to these emails, but do you know who Christopher Essex is? I do. Uh, and what is his role? Uh, he is in the credit risk team, one of the credit specialists who looks after this portfolio. I see. And if you go down the page, there's an email um, from a Megan Eldridge. Is, is she also part of that team? No. It looks like from the signature she's a frontline staff member. I see. And she's there said... 
Please see attached the two screenshots from the calculator. The first is prior to inputting the expenses and the second after the personal living expenses are added. The net monthly sur surplus does not change. Do you see that? Yeah, I see that. And does that demonstrate that, or does that, is that an, an error uh, in relation to the serviceability, which was uh, the subject of this email? No, I don't think it was an error. Um, <clears throat> what I think the frontline staff member is saying, well, I put in a number and nothing changed with the net surplus. You'd recall from the consumer round of hearings that we spoke a lot about him, income-based him. I believe what the response is at the top of the email is saying that him is used in both calculations because whatever the declared expense was, was below that him benchmark and therefore him continue to be used in both scenarios. I see. And that, and so you, you hadn't had any discussions in relation to that particular issue with those? No, I think it's entirely sound, uh, you know, using, so bear in mind, SBO looks at both the business and the person, director or directors, and looks at both of them in terms of the servicing of the loan. And this here would be referring to the person, the director, let's say. And if they declared an expense number that was too low, we use the income-based HEM, which I know that's the subject of a much broader discussion, but I think in the context of this, it was appropriate. In, in relation to the defaults that you've identified in your, uh, in, in your statement, is it your evidence that you can't assist by informing how many were due or possibly due to the way in which the, the checks were done at the time of setting up the accounts? You say the checks verification and the like? Yes, the criteria um, that was applied. No, and I don't think we had cause to go to that level of analysis, given that the performance of this portfolio, you know, notwithstanding the system areas we'll talk about, um, the credit performance of this product has actually been good. Mr Van Horen, can I go to another topic, please? You've given evidence about the interest rate and at the relevant time, it was 16%. Is that, is that S right? Yes, for SBO, yeah. That is in relation to the SBO. Yeah. Uh, and you've explained, and this is your, what I'll call your second statement, even though I think it, it's later in time, but it relates to rubric 3.15. Uh, and you've explained what, you've explained in your statement the misconduct in, in connection with business overdraft facilities. Can you explain to the Commission what the issue was that arose, first in 2013 and then again um, in 2015-16? Yeah, it's, I'll try and, it's, a, it's quite a technically complicated thing, but I'll try and summarise it as best I can. And I can say that the issue that arose on, on BODs and SBOs was substantially the same underlying issue, so we don't need to differentiate too much. And it's an issue, it's one issue that has persisted through time as opposed to two different issues arising in the 2013 and 16 periods. And um, the, 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 the summary of it would be that um, an overdraft is attached to a transaction account. So if I use the acronym of BTA, business transaction account is one such transaction account. So think of that as your day-to-day -day bank account. The overdraft is applied on top of that. We have things called price options, which is sort of bank jargon for essentially saying that every product construct has its own set of pricing features, which could be interest rates or fees. So a BTA will have its own price options, so will an SBO, and so will a BOD, because the pricing is different on each of those products. The core problem we had here was a whole series of migrations, which I've summarized in my statement. Um, what happened was the, um, the account that had, let's just say SBO in this case, was sourcing the interest rate to be charged from two different systems. And what, by sourcing it from two different systems, what happened to the interest charge that was it? What uh, that meant was it, it sourced the interest rate from, I can go into more detail if you'd like, but sourced it from uh, two systems and charged both of those interest rates to the account, which meant that the customer was being overcharged. It's not technically double, but near enough. No, in fact, it was slightly more than double yeah. because there was an internal price. Um, well, instead of the 16%, there was an internal price, and I think you describe it as an external price, the outcome of which was 33.94%. Correct. It was, it's not so much driven by internal, external. It's driven by um, the correct interest rate should have been 16%, and it applied, the system applied that rate. It also um, applied another interest rate, which was not actually... The normal interest rate was a thing called the excess debit interest rate. 
which is normally when a customer's over limit. So that was an error. Um, and then applied both of those, which, why, which is why it added up to the 33.9%. I see. And in your evidence, you say that in August 2013, and I understand you weren't in your current position then, but CBI identified a problem with this pricing uh, in relation to the SBOs, is that right? Yes. And then in the November of the same year, identified the problem for um, business overdrafts? Yes. And the problem was, I mean, if you forgive me, I'll call it the double interest because it wasn't, in, it was almost double. Instead, of, it was 33.94% yep. instead of 16%. Correct. And in fact, internally, you called it the double interest. Yeah, I think, you know, correctly, we're calling it overcharging because it's technically not double, but yeah, more or less. And can you explain how the issue was dealt with in 2013 so as to remedy this defect? Yeah, so that was the first problem. So in 2013, there was a branch, uh, customer complaint at a branch, was identified. It was then uh, an incident was created, which was managed at a fairly um, sort of low level in the organization amongst the technology teams. Um, it was not fully understood as to the scale of the problem, and so that was uh, that was the the first sort of major incident, as we'd call it. What was done was um, a manual process was put in place to try and identify where this was occurring, and manual control reports were run, and they were then customers were corrected. Um, so, to the, to the best of our knowledge, collectively, we thought that there was a manual process in place that was preventing customers being overcharged. Um, and that was from 2013, late 2013 to 2015, when a system fix was put in place. I'll and that system, that system fix was put in place in May 2015? That's right. That was almost two years later. Why did it take so long? Uh, well, number one, to the best of our knowledge, we didn't realise that there was still an ongoing problem. So we thought that the manual process was fixing it and putting all customers in the position they should have been. Um, and number two, it was, um, you know, Getting a system change in the pipeline requires testing. It has to get into these various scheduled releases, um, and it was scheduled for the May 2015. It was actually scheduled for February 2015, then got pushed back to May because the testing showed there were some issues. And if I understand correctly, what happened then was because of the two figures feeding in, on a statement, a customer would get a debit interest charge which was one, one figure without any interest rate referred to, and it would appear as their interest rate for the relevant period. Yeah, from memory, um, I think what you would see on the customer's bank statement, whether it was paper or online, would be, let's just say, $100 of the interest charge for that period. Um, and it, the narration didn't have the interest rate in that line, if I remember correctly, but it certainly did have it further down in the statement saying that you should be paying 16% interest rate. So that was the disconnect. It was $100, it should have been, for argument's sake, 50 or Correct. 45 or something. Um, so it didn't tie up with what the interest rate... Were you been. aware of that overcharging issue when it happened in 2013? No. Uh, and did you approve the CBA incident management team's implementation of the fix in 2013? No, I wasn't in that business at all. Uh, and it's now acknowledged, is it not, that that the two, um, that the fix that was applied at the time was, uh, was not sufficient to stop the problem happening? Yes, it, it, it's, it did stop the problem for 95 plus percent of cases. And again, it gets quite technical here and don't want to bore the commission, commissioner, but um, not going to bore me with detail on this, Mr. Van I Horen. Won't. Don't hold back on the detail because if you do, I'll be asking you about it. <laughs> so go into the detail. Okay. Um, so the the May 2015 fix um, was the system-based fix that ensured that uh, for, as I say, 95 plus percent of customers that overcharging stopped occurring. What it didn't do was a fairly um, unusual set of customer circumstances where a customer was on a certain underlying transaction account, and let's just say I'll call it a premium business account, that's another type of um, business account, uh, call it a PBA, and then they switched from a PBA to a BTA, a business transaction account, which is a different kind of transaction account, slight differences uh, for customers, and then got an SBO on top of that. 
And so what we call that multiple switches. So there are multiple switches of the price options from this product to the second product and then to the third product. And when we did the system fix in May 2015, we did not cater properly for that type of scenario. So it was a miss, clearly an, a te fairly technical error though. Yes, although a technical error that you'll concede affected an, quite a number of customers. Yeah, just to be clear, um, so when we come to the, the remediation we then did in 2016-17, that went right back to 2013. So it, cool. it, it dealt with the 5% who weren't fixed after May 15, but it also dealt with uh, you know, near 100% that weren't fixed prior to May 15. I just understand better than I do why you say this is a technical, particularly technical matter. I, I mean technical in the sense of, um, you know, I sort of hesitate to use the word coding error, system error, but it essentially was in that category where we did not, we you know, take accountability for that as a business, um, we did not specify requirements which would cater for all of these multiple kinds of customer use cases or scenarios, and that was a scenario or set of customer circumstances that was not um, spelt out so and Mr. therefore Van Horen, built. The, the, the complexity of which you speak uh, is something you need to explain to me much better. At the moment, it seems to me, uh, in 2013, CBA knew that at least some SBO customers were being charged double interest or more than double interest. Is that right? That's right. Well, that problem's stated in one sentence. And the solution surely is to check whether every SBO is being charged the right interest. Yeah. Yeah? Now, no doubt uh, coders, programmers, Many other people have got to do a lot of things behind the scene. But is the problem more complex and the solution more complex than that which I have described? I think that's a fair summary, Commissioner. It's well, let's hear no more about how okay. technical it is, Mr Van Hoor, and it seems to me to be a, a nasty, difficult, small problem that may require quite a deal of work to solve it, but the problem apparent to the bank in 13 was SBO customers are being charged double. Yes. And what did the bank do about it? Do you want me to answer that question? Yes. What we did about it in 2013 was put in place a manual process whilst we were developing the system-based fix, which then happened in May 15. So that was a manual process which did run, I have to say, intermittently, or we can't confirm going back to find records that it was run every single month, but it was a monthly manual process to identify the known cases. The problem, our, our failing was, it was not comprehensive and it missed a very substantial part of the cases that we subsequently found. How many did it miss? How many people are we talking about? Well, ultimately, uh, there were, uh, it's in my statement, I think there were about 2,500 uh, SBO cases and about 300 BOD cases, which to put it in context was approximately 12% of SBOs and approximately 2% of BODs. So it wasn't the whole base, it was a fairly small proportion of the whole customer base. Now you mentioned in your statement that there was a FOS complaint? Yes. Uh, and. When were you made aware of the fact that there had been a FOS complaint in relation to this issue? In uh, July 2016. Uh, and you're aware, however, that the customer raised a complaint with the bank a little over a year earlier, on the 25th of June 2015? Yes, I am now aware. Um, now, I won't use the name of the customer, but you are aware that a customer contacted CBA about the overcharging issue in June 2015? Yes. Uh, and if I could take you to CBA.0001.0281.0001. The customer, um, whose name is redacted, and I'll just simply call the customer, 
and I'll take you to the second paragraph. This person was a small who says it all started with a bank. I own a small business uh, and have been trading for five years. I had taken out a business loan with this banking institution and was given access to an overdraft loan of $5,000. Do you yep. see that? Yes. And then the next paragraph, this person explains that since November 2014, my business had some quiet weeks due to school holidays, Easter weekends, public holidays and a few days of flooding, all of which, con sorry, which all contributed to my business not sustaining my outgoings and everyday living expenses. I then used the overdraft to stay afloat to feed my family, myself, and pay bills and run my business. However, it was running out fast. Yes. If I could skip down, if I may, to not the next paragraph, but that after. Going over my statements, I noted that the interest rate on the overdraft was being calculated and charged at a daily rate, as well as repaying the overdraft amount and high interest. My business account was being drained completely. I had to borrow money from a family member to put into the account. That money was also taken out as soon as it hit my account and my balance became non-existent. Yep. And then the person goes on to say, I arranged a meeting with my accountant who advised me that if I could not borrow more money to pay the overdraft back plus the interest, that I should be prepared to close down my business and probably lose my home as well if I could not afford to repay the mortgage. Yeah. And then on the next page, the customer goes on. To say, I was sitting in my salon one afternoon in dire depression and financial despair, thinking I had no other options left but to take the advice of my accountant, when I came across an interesting fact on a Facebook article about this particular bank releasing their annual profits of 30 billion profit for the overdraft interest earnings for the last financial year. And then the person goes on to explain, this prompted me to return to my bank and ask the question, why would my interest charge is extremely high and even higher than a day-to-day -day credit card from another banking institution that I have? I was told I agreed and signed the overdraft loan at 16% interest rate and quite directly and abruptly told that a bank is a business and that is the price you pay for borrowing money. They also told me they withdrew interest fees quarterly. However, my account statement showed that interest charges were being taken out on a monthly basis. I queried this in tears, not the first time. On three separate occasions, I had broken down in the bank, asking them to help, to help me understand why it didn't matter much. I was trying to pay back my overdraft and high interest charges that I could not get ahead. And then the, per the person goes on to exp uh, say, they finally agreed to look further into my account and see why I was being charged and paying high interest on a monthly statement rather than quarterly. Within one hour of my final plea and tears, they checked into my overdraft situation. That just did not seem right in my calculations and I was informed that I was being charged double interest at 32% instead of 16% on a monthly or quarterly basis due to a complete computer glitch in their system and that this had been, that I'd been paying this since the first direct withdrawal payment since November 2014. Do you see that? Yep. You would, uh, in the end, the overpayment was a, um, a, a matter of hundreds of dollars for this person. Uh, but you'd, you would accept that it, she claimed that it had a significant effect on her life. Yeah. And when the customer approached CBA in June 2015, you accept that CBA did not invest, investigate the overcharging issue more broadly? I think that's right. And that was despite what had happened in 2013? Yep, I think the two were not connected at the right time early enough, yep. No, but it also was the case that this person wasn't the only customer complaint that CBA had received concerning this issue in 2015, was it? Uh, to my knowledge, from all the records I've looked at, I think there were about six or seven complaints of similar or broadly similar nature in roughly the same time period. I see. If I could pause there, if I could tender that document, Commissioner. What's the date of the letter? The 5th of November 2015. Letter to CBA, 5 November 15, CBA 0001 0281 exhibit 3.46. Thank you, Commissioner. You state that in your statement, that is in your second statement, that between July and September, 
And as a result of this FOSS complaint, CBA became aware that there were gaps in the solutions that it had implemented. Is that right? Yes. And this issue was elevated because this person had gone to FOSS to the executive committee. Is that right? Uh, the, once we'd identified the overcharging issue, yes, we, had, we um, escalated that to the executive committee. We didn't and it, talk about the specific customer, though. That was well. It was because this person had. It was because this person had gone to FOSS that it was elevated to the executive committee, wasn't it? It was elevated to me. So one of our standard processes, if you've got a, a long-standing or more than 90 days FOSS complaint, then there's various reports that, it, that happen. And I received a report in July 2016, which, and in reading the detail, uh, it didn't look right. And so I asked the question, could this be happening to more customers? Which then triggered the investigation to say, was it a systemic issue? And that then resulted in reports to Exco and so on. Yep. That's right, but you didn't do anything until it was, but nothing was done until it was escalated, um, and it was only escalated because of the FOSS complaint, wasn't it? Um, well, certainly from my point of view, the first time I heard about it was when the FOSS complaint was Well, do you escalated. accept that there weren't proper systems in place <clears throat> yeah. during 2015 to ensure that the issue was dealt with properly? I think that's a fair statement, and, and having looked at a number of the... Um, emails and various correspondence that occurred in that 2015 to 16 period, I think we didn't do what, what we expect to have done, should we expect Are you aware done? that FOS is obliged to identify, resolve and report on systemic issues and serious misconduct to ASIC? Uh, I'm not aware that they report to ASIC, but they certainly uh, alert us to issues that they think could be systemic, and we then typically look at those in more detail. And a systemic issue is defined as one uh, that's an issue that can have an effect on people beyond the parties to the dispute, so beyond this particular customer? Yeah, I don't know if there's a legal definition, but that's the common sense definition, yeah. Now, when this issue... When this issue was first being dealt with before it came to you, there was an email which I'd like to take you to cba.0001.0281.01.2016. Excuse me just for a moment, Mr Van Horen. My learned friend, Mr Sherry, has rightly pointed out that the letter, which has just been tendered, ought to be tendered perhaps not as being addressed to the bank, Commissioner. It's to whom it may concern. It does... Uh, the description of the Exhibit 3.46 should be a uh, letter directed to whom it may concern, uh, 5 November 15, uh, concerning interest overcharging. Mr Van Horen, you did see that letter though, didn't you, at the time that the FOSS complaint was made? No, I saw that letter now in the lead up to the Royal Commission. I saw, um, so the way we, we get reporting from the group customer relations team, which is coincidentally where the next email comes from, um, that reporting summarises, you know, as you can imagine, there's lots of yes. feedback we get all the time. Um, it summarises complaints, so I didn't see that individual customer letter at the you time. You didn't no. personally, but, he, but it was within the bank's records. I'd have so. to check that. I couldn't say if it was or wasn't. Okay, thank you. That's... Uh, I was... If I can take you to return to the email, this was on the 14th of July 2015, so about a month, uh, or not even, perhaps, um, three or four weeks after the complaint had been made by yep. the customer. And do you see that there's a discussion there or a summary of the issue? <coughs> I'll let you have a look at it. Do you agree that this is the, uh, the what became the FOSS complaint? Yes. Uh, and it summarises, due to some system error, we have been charging customer 32% interest on her BTA instead of 16%. Yeah. You see that? Uh, down 
a couple uh, of dot points. Customer recently applied for PL to clear this OD, the overdraft, which was declined due to servicing. Uh, the customer has refused to provide documents because she provided this recently at the branch when she applied for PL. Um, and then you see the recommendation is to resolve the matter, I recommend to early charge off and approve a payment arrangement of $50 a week. Do you see that? I see that. And then it says, if not, the matter will escalate and might be raised as systemic because it could be happening with more customers too. Do you see that? I see that. So is it the position... Does that... Do I understand that email to be a suggestion that it be settled so that the issue isn't raised and thus becomes a systemic issue? Yeah, so I've obviously made inquiries around that email when I saw it. Um, my initial reaction was surprise um, because this is the part of the bank that typically tries to resolve complaints. I think the person was clearly trying to resolve the complaint for the customer, um, but it's also the part of the bank that normally escalates issues when there are concerns. So, And that didn't, didn't it, happen in this case? It did certainly it? didn't look like it happened yet. And... Now, the customer wasn't satisfied with that settlement. Um, is that the case? Yeah, my understanding, having looked at the, pro the case, the customer initially asked for $100,000. She then revised that request to $10,000. Um, we then put in place this proposal. It then moved around a few times and without preempting where you're gonna go, I think we offered from memory $2,750. Uh, to recognise, I think, the hardship and the, well, I've, used, I've not used that word, ah. to recognise the unique circumstances of the customer and the stress, and, and you know, she referenced that in her letter, um, but it was clear that she was in a difficult position, so we, we proposed to obviously fix the problem and make a goodwill payment, which I think was appropriate. She didn't accept that. FOS ruled on it. Uh, I believe they suggested we pay her $1,500, which was less than what we'd offered, and she didn't accept that either. And... Commissioner, perhaps if I could tender that um, email. Uh, email 14 July 15 to CNCS Escalation, CBA 00102810179, Exhibit 3.47. Uh, well, this person not being um, satisfied with that uh, response then went to FOS. Yeah. And it was because of that FOS, sorry, perhaps I can put it this way, had the customer not taken the complaint to FOS, CBA would not have realised that this overcharging issue was a high priority so as to warrant further investigation? Yeah, I can't predict what would have happened, but uh, that was certainly the trigger for the issue being escalated and brought to my attention. Can I take you to, you referred previously to the nature in which some negotiation occurred with this particular customer. If I can take you to CBA.0001.0281.0182. And you'll see in the bottom part of the email there's a reference to the same uh, person who was the subject of the earlier email. And there was a proposal there approved to early charge off the account and accept $50 per week as life arrangement to clear the debt. Do you see that? Yep. Then the response was given at the top. The customer has declined to enter into a payment arrangement for the BTA and has threatened to take it to the media. Do you see that? Yep. Please review for waiver of the whole debt. Yep. And in fact, perhaps I can tender that email before I go. Email 28 July 15 to CNCS Escalation, CBA 0001 0281 Exhibit 3.48. Then, thank you, Commissioner. The next document is CBA.001.0281.0194. Do you see that? Sorry, Mr Van Horen. Yep, got it. And it says in the middle of the page, and this is approximately a week later, as discussed, please place your approval to waive the debt of $3,494 as a commercial decision to resolve the matter. Do you see that? I do. So it was when the person threatened to go to the, the media, then CBA increased its, um, its offer there. Do you see that? I do. Um, and... 
there was two reasons for um, CBA wishing to have this dealt with speedily. One was the bad PR. Fair to say. One was also the fear of it being identified as a systemic issue. I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't extrapolate from, I don't think that's a fair extrapolation from that one person's email because certainly from my point of view, and I think this is a widely held view, if there is a systemic issue, we want to know about it so we can fix it. But the process so I, I, I wouldn't be comfortable saying that that was a CBA view. No, it perhaps was, I could put it, it this way. It was pretty much against policy what you saw there as well. I've checked that. So the process failed in this case. It did. Uh, now, ultimately, there was a remediation program, wasn't there? Yes. And CBA discovered after this customer had raised the issue for FOS and processes were put in place that remediation had to occur in respect of 338 business overdrafts, is that correct, accounts? Yes, the bods, yeah. And there were 2,354 SBO customers affected? That's right. And of those, 1,490 of them were remediated, is that right? Yep. And am I right that the remediation was nearly $3 million in total? Correct, if you add the two together. And, over two, and you've given evidence that there was over 2,500 customers affected? Correct. Now, it's your evidence that, if I understand it correctly, that the average time between when the person was overcharged or charged the double interest and when they were remediated, took, it took 960 days, is that right? Uh, you need to be a little careful. So that was from, uh, it, it was 240 days from when we identified it. It was 960 days from when it first started happening yes. to when the remediation was completed on average. Well, that is from the time that they paid the amount. The first time, yep. It was 960 days, approximately two and a half years. Correct. Uh, and that was... Uh, and you say in your, your evidence that a customer remediation program was instigated um, and letters were sent out about four months later in March 2017, is that right? Uh, for SBOs, yes. I think for BODs it was May, June. I see. <clears throat> uh, so you accept, don't you, that the time that was taken was too long? It was certainly too long to identify the issue in the first place. I think the time we took once we had identified the issue was, uh, was not inappropriate because there's quite a lot of work you've got to do once you identify an issue to understand how widespread it is, fix the problem, figure out who you're going to remediate, get letters, etc., sorted out. So it was reasonable. And... Perhaps I can tend, excuse me for a moment, I forgot to tend to that document, I'm sorry. Uh, email 6 August 15 to GCR, first point correspondence, CBA 0001028101194, exhibit 3.49. Um, you just said your evidence was that from the time of identification, a reasonable amount of time, you think that it was a reasonable amount of time, is that right? Yeah, I think give or take, it was a reasonable time. Well, you, your evidence would be that, sorry, you would say that that ought to be done as um, quickly as possible? I think it needs to be done properly is the, is the primary goal. Um, and yes, we, we, we do try and uh, expedite it. Um, and you did everything in your power to expedite it, did you? Uh, well, I think you're coming to something in... February, uh, February 2017, where I requested a delay of 10 days. So yes. subject to that, yes. Okay, and is it right that you requested a delay of 10 days? You asked for all this to happen after the House of Representatives hearing on 7 March, so as to eliminate the chance of this being brought up in the hearings? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Happy to explain context. And when you say all this, this was specifically around the 
um, not fixing the problem. It was around the letters to customers and the uh, refunds. I, I'm not, I don't wish to mislead you for a moment. If I can take you to CBA.0001.0292.5963, Uh, and if you go to the, if I could ask to go to the next page so that you have the context. So, Mr. Leo had sent you an email. Hi, Clive. Emailing you a quick update re SBO DDI progress. Yep. See that letters and refunds will be distributed end of March. Permanent fix Fair. will be implemented, etc. And then the next, if I can go back to the first page, and I think I was. Uh, I think I was faithful to what Pretty you accurate, said. Yeah. Can we make all this happen, letters and actual refunds after the House of Reps hearing on 7 March, eliminates the chance of this being brought up in the hearings and a delay of 10 days is immaterial. Is that right? Yep. You'd accept that, that, that the customers who are affected wouldn't be too happy to be aware of the basis for the further delay, wouldn't you? Yeah, I agree with that. That would be below what the community would expect of CBA, wouldn't you? Yeah, I think it was a... And no, yeah. Finish your answer. I, say, I think it was a poor judgement on my part, so I'll definitely take it on myself. I'm um, happy to explain why I made that call, but I agree. It was a have poor that. Why call. did you make the call? Uh, so, firstly, at the time, we did not believe there was any reportable breach. We probably will come to that as well, Mr. Danelli. But we did not think this was a breach. And in good faith, that was the view we had at the time. Um, secondly, you know, in terms of materiality, uh, and I appreciate if you, you know, one of those customers affected and you're waiting for your refund, it's very material to you. However, it was less than 1,500 customers out of 10 million. It was, you know, point, I think, zero. 0.2% of our total earnings, so it was a re very small issue in the scheme of things. Um, and weighing quite heavily on my mind was a fairly recent experience we'd had with customer letters going out which were um, caused major uh, distress to whether internally or externally around um, paper statement fees. And personally, I was quite bruised by that, and I thought the risk of putting out letters right into a House of Reps hearing where these letters would, would potentially get picked up and reported in a way which was, if the previous experience was, was in any scope, I was factually 100% wrong. Um, judgment call I made in the moment, and you know you get hundreds of emails a day and you make a pretty quick judgment decision, and I accept it was the wrong decision, but that was the decision I made. You know that one of the issues that this Commission, of course, is investigating is whether any misconduct is attributable to a particular culture or governance practices of an entity. You know that? Yep. And it might be open to say that CBA here was more affected by media and PR than ensuring the right thing by its customers. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's quite as cut and dried as that because if I go to the, the other example, the customers were... I, I think in short answer, yes. Um, but as I said, weighing in my mind was a, a scenario where customers were certainly very confused by the way a matter had been reported. Uh, now, this issue, this issue, either in 2013 or 2015, 16, was, was not elevated to the board, was it? Um, no, and I don't think it would be appropriate, given the materiality of the issue, to go to the board. The CEO, though, in the last week has met with ASIC, hasn't he? Uh, RCO, yes, he has. Uh, and one of the issues discussed was this very issue? I believe it? so. So I think the context for that meeting, as I understand, was our CEO, new CEO, was meeting with new chair of ASIC, um, trying to, I think the purpose of the meeting was, this is how we want to work together going forward. And um, as part of that, this issue was uh, mentioned by our CEO to the chair of ASIC. Is it right that CBA didn't report this overcharging issue to ASIC in 2013? Yeah, I don't think there was any way we knew nearly enough about its report in 2013. And in 2015, it wasn't... 2016, it wasn't reported to ASIC either, was Correct. it? Correct. Uh, it was considered how... You're aware under Section 912D that there's a requirement to inform... Uh, sorry, Section 912D of the Corporations Act, a requirement to inform ASIC as soon as practicable of breaches of financial services law and within 10 days. Yeah. I... And two groups... Sorry, Mr Van Horn. 
Yeah, so you know, if you want to know what we thought about at the time, perhaps I should wait for you to answer, ask the question. Well, at the time, if I can, two groups within CBA considered this issue, didn't they? They did. Uh, and those groups were both your team, if I can put it that way, that is yep. the SBO team, and also, uh, and also the team responsible uh, for the business overdrafts. That's right. And both determined that there was no need to uh, notify ASIC under section 912D, didn't they? That's right. Uh, and it was con your group, was it? Was that the, what's described in the documents as the DDI scrum, the double digit interest scrum meetings? Yes. Um, and were you part of that group? Um, yes, yeah, so I'd moved to a different role, however, because I had history with the uh, SBO, I carried on sponsoring uh, the resolution uh, rather than ask a new person to try and get across an issue that I had more history on. See, and during it didn't, that... Didn't mean I was there in every meeting, but I was the sponsor of that, yes. Okay. Uh, well, there was a meeting on the 24th of November. Um, so, I've, um, perhaps I didn't tend to the previous document. I'm sorry, Your Honour. I think that's the third time I've... Perhaps I can tender if the previous document, CBA.0001.0292.5963. Is that the previous document? Uh, emails between Leo and Van Horen with that doc ID becomes exhibit 3.50. Thank you. Uh, perhaps if I can take you to CBA.0002.1674.1040. This is, uh, I think I described it for double digit interest DDI scrum minutes. Double yep. debit, I think. Yeah. Debit, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and uh, the various members of that team are set out at the top. The, what's called the scrum master is Mr. Leo, who you sent that email to. Yeah. And then various other members of, you're an apology to this meeting. Yeah. Um, I think I asked you previously, are you the most senior person? There. Uh, yeah, I think I would be the most senior on the distribution. List, and yes. at number four, it says, "Will in, will, will we inform ASIC as best practice?" Correct. You see that, and that there was no notification made to ASIC at that time, was there? No, there wasn't. As as you said, we gave it active consideration, though. Uh, and during that time, FOS also wrote to you and. Um, indicated that it considered that the issue was systemic. They did. Uh, and asked you why you hadn't reported it to ASIC, didn't they? They did. Uh, and it wasn't until the eve of your evidence, that is on the 15th of May, that it, a disclosure was made to ASIC, wasn't it? That's right. Um, and I think Mr Sh Sherry took or referred to it uh, briefly Previously, if I can take you to, sorry, if I could tender that scrum meeting document, CBA.0002.1674.1040. Those DDI scrum minutes become exhibit 3.51. <coughs> and if I can take you to exhibit 6A. Uh, so it's CBA.0517.0096.6000. I've got it if you want to carry on. Thank you. Uh, and CBA now concedes that the conduct was misleading or deceptive. Is that right? Yes. That is, it was a breach of Section 12 DA of that's the right. ASIC Act. Yeah, I believe so. And that's because a false or misleading statement was made in each of the statements sent to the people who were affected. Is that right? Yeah, correct. You can see the summary says... It, it summarises uh, the basis on which we did not originally report it, and that's because BODs and SPOs are not financial products. That's right. Uh, and therefore not regulated by Corporations Act and AFSL, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
But you can see now that And then coming to prepare for the Royal Commission, clearly we gave this matter a whole lot more thought, um, considered different views, and uh, it's now clear that there was a reportable breach, specifically around the mm -hmm. statements misrepresenting what the interest rate uh, was or should have been. Now, your evidence is that there were uh, approximately 2,500 um, customers who um, had been affected by uh, had been affected by the overcharge. Yes. Uh, and your evidence is that the average lifespan from commencement of the issue to the completion of the remediation was 960 days. Is that right? Yeah, from the commencement of the overcharging, yes. And during that time, those people would have received a statement. Is it your evidence that they received statements six monthly, if I recall correctly? From memory, uh, six monthly applies to personal account statements. These would have been business account statements, which are three monthly. That's right. So therefore, And it's available 24-7 online, of course. So well, if I, yeah, that means over these two and a half years, there would have been 10 statement cycles. Is that right? Approximately. And then if that's right, there are likely to have been 10 statements for each affected customer on average? Uh, yeah, I need to check the maths, but it would have been something of that order. Yeah. And then if there were 2,500 customers affected, you would concede that there's 25,000 instances of those false or misleading representations, is that right? Oh, look, I think this feels to me like a very um, legal interpretation of the legislation and I absolutely couldn't agree. You know, I, I don't know enough about that to say yes. Um, well, you, your letter did say, if I can go to the third page, there may have been... So it's point zero, sorry, point six zero zero two. If you go just above further action, the issue may also give rise to other breaches of the financial services law. Yep. Given the, what you've said is a misleading or deceptive statement in relation to the amount of interest, if that's considered part of the price of the facility, you'd also accept that there may have been uh, an, a breach in so far as section 12 DB or another section of the ASIC Act, insofar as there are false misleading s statements made in relation to the price of the facility, that would also be a breach? I, I don't understand that. So Perhaps. you asked me quite a legal question. I'm, I'm not going to be able to give That's you fine. A, an answer to that. That's fine. I can move on. Uh, there's just two final issues. You mentioned the scrum um, meetings. Yep. Um, and they were held, if I'm right, between September 2016 when the issue was elevated to you and to the executive, or sorry, to the executive committee until about January 2017, is that right? Sounds about right, yeah. Um, and that was the forum where you raised issues about the double interest issue? It was about, that was a forum that was trying to fix the issue. I see, and, and um, deal with remediation? Correct. Deal with whether or not to inform ASIC? Correct. Uh, and... I won't, in the interest of time, I won't take you to them, but um, there were meetings, um, I think it's your evidence those meetings were held on a bi-weekly basis. Some might have been cancelled, I think, but on a bi-weekly basis. You had two different meetings, is that right? Well, once we'd identified the issue, I certainly felt a sense of um, concern, and so we initially started that meeting twice a week just to get the momentum up and the focus up, and then it became once a week, and then I think it stretched out as there was sufficient progress happening. Okay, and that was, that was an important forum for resolving the issues? It was a simple forum where issues were tabled and uh, if they weren't solved in the forum, then other people outside the forum would be able to help. Um, and did you contribute to the relevant discussions? Um, just from my review of the, the Scrum Minutes, I was in some of the Scrums, probably not in all of, I certainly wasn't in all of them. Um, well, did you attend any of the meetings? I, d I think I did attend several, well, certainly at the beginning. Well, if we can take you to CBA.0001.0281.0500. This is a scrum minutes for the 15th of September 2016.
might remember it if you want to just ask me what's... Um, that was, I think, that was a meeting that after the executive committee had been informed, is that right? What's the date of that? The 15th of September, 2016. Uh, from memory, the flash report to Exco was at the end of September, so they might have been just before the, okay. the Exco. Do you recall report. your an apology to that meeting? I, I don't recall that off the top of my head, no. Um, the next minutes that are, have been produced by CBA is for a meeting on the 29th of September. Um, and we're having some difficulty with getting up these documents, but of course I can show you each of those. But that meeting that occurred on the 29th of September, you were also an apology to that one? I could well have been. Well, in fact, in fact, we have minutes of six different meetings, uh, and they're the only, doc the only minutes that were provided by CBA, and you're an apology to every single one of those, Mr Van Horen. Yeah, it's possible. As I said, I was doing a different job. Um, there was a very capable person leading that scrum, and I had full confidence in their ability to, to lead that. Was the issue taken seriously enough? because the most senior person didn't even attend one of those meetings? No, that's Mr. not Bain. correct. I absolutely did attend those meetings in the beginning. Well, if... Perhaps you don't have those minutes, but I uh, recall clearly... Well, that's a matter... We've received six minutes, and in relation to each of those six, um, you were an apology. Uh, I can give you diary notes if that helps, but I absolutely attended the first, uh, first meetings of that scrum. The, the last issue I'd like to deal with is this. Uh, Commissioner, if I could tender that document, that is the 15th September 2016 minutes uh, for the meeting on the 15th of September 2016. Exhibit 3.52, uh, DDI Scrum minutes 15 September 16, CBA 001 0281080500. Conscious of time, Commissioner, and the fact that my learner leader, Ms Orr, needs to deal with uh, the lay witness. There are the other minutes that I would also like to tender, but perhaps that can be arranged um, on the papers if that is convenient to the Commission and to CBA. Is there any difficulty doing it that way, Mr Sherry? No, sir. Very well. Uh, can I well, they can be uh, form part of the bundle, which will be Exhibit 3.52, bundle uh, of DDI scrum minutes. Thank you, sir. Yes. Um, the final issue I'd like to deal with is that that you raised in your evidence. It is the position, is it not, that for the SBOs, if there was a refund of less than $5, that wasn't um, refunded. Is that correct? That's right. Um, but for the business overdrafts, it was refunded. It was. Refunded. <coughs> um, and can I, are you, am I right to say, or can I um, ask you, why that money wasn't refunded to those under five dollars? <coughs> the, the total dollar value we're talking about was eight hundred dollars. Um, in respect of those roughly eight hundred and sixty customers uh, that were not refunded under five dollars, and uh, part of the reason is I think from memory three hundred and twenty of those customers were due a refund between one and ninety nine cents. We've had a lot of feedback from customers in the past when there's a closed account and they get a check in the mail for call it thirty seven cents. Um, that actually causes more annoyance than anything else. Um, so we apply what we applied what we felt was a reasonable cutoff. Um, and it's certainly not about keeping the $800. It's not going to. That's not the point. Um, there's more um, administrative hassle for many customers to receive that level of refund. And it's also that you wanted to reduce the exposure to negative PR again, isn't it? No, not at all. OK, can I take you please to CBA.001.0281.0806? And if I could take you to 0808. It's an email. What's happening here? Sorry, it might be my fault. CBA.0001.0281.0806.
Miss, do you want to just describe it? If it yeah, Mr Leo wrote an email to Mr Walker. You weren't party to that initially, but he said there, hi James, rationale for $5 below, and he deals with a number of um, issues, one of which is reduce exposure to negative PR, i.e. removing 840 customers from the 2,300 with low refund amounts. Yeah, there, there may be in the email. I don't, I don't buy that at all. Well, um, personally, it wouldn't motivate me in the slightest. I think if we're going to be writing to customers, we're writing to customers. There's not a big difference between uh, whatever, 1,500 and 2,300. You say, hi, I'm fine with $5 as long as it's not inconsistent with the overall remediation framework Caleb's team has developed. Cheers. That's See, right. you? Yep, that's right. And it, so was have, it, it was inconsistent with the other one because they had been refunded those amounts by way of a mm, refund into it, their It account. was inconsistent with the BODS one, but it was not inconsistent with the retail approach. So the retail approach had previously used, in fact, higher cutoffs than $5, and I wanted to make sure that we were being consistent with that, which was the one that I had sight of. And no further questions. Can you... Horan, can I just, before Mr Sherry has his chance, can I ask you a general question about computer-generated uh, errors about fees or interest. Yes. Uh, computer systems depend on what goes into them and the way they're structured. Of course, there will be errors. Uh, and from time to time, those errors will surface, I take it, at some level in the bank, whether it's at the branch counter or elsewhere. Now, I just want to understand the approach of CBA if it becomes aware that there is what appears to be a computer-generated error in connection either with fees charged or interest charged to an account. And I wanted to ask you whether it was practical, sensible, useful uh, to impose a system that said in effect unless and until you demonstrate that this error is unique, it will be treated as systemic. Is that possible, sensible, useful, pie in the sky? Difficult <laughs> um, one, Commissioner. You, you know, you're quite right that unfortunately, and of course none of us want this, but you know, system errors arise. So if we had to say that every time there was any kind of error, and errors arise not just in relation to interest and fees, unfortunately there can be in any number of issues. We've previously had the responsible lending case for the personal overdrafts. Um, you know, I, I think the appropriate thing we try and do is we try and get to the bottom of how systemic it is. I think it would be quite impractical to say that assume that everything is systemic. You know, I don't think regulators would I don't presume to speak for ASIC, but I don't think they would want us to report issues as systemic issues I'm every time there's an issue. I'm talking about reporting. I'm talking about the bank's reaction. Yeah. That is, should the bank itself treat this as potentially a serious issue until yeah. it is demonstrated to be a unique or yeah. close to unique uh, case where garbage in, garbage sure. out? Oh, look, uh, you know, 100% acknowledge that we haven't handled this one well. There's no debate about that. but. I think it would be quite challenging to assume that every issue is systemic before you know a little bit more about it. Inevitably, you've got to go and understand the issue and is it a one-off, is it something that could be repeated? And you know, for better or worse, we have dozens of these every, every week and the large majority of them turn out to be very small and very isolated. Sometimes they're not. Um, so I, I suppose the short answer would be it would be uh, you know, we're challenging, practically we're challenging to assume as a default everything's systemic until disproven. Because I'm struck by the fact that this uh, was observed, found, thought to be solved, but not. Yeah. And it's the but not. Yes. That uh, is, is what yeah. is troubling me. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I could talk to you at length, there's no time for that now, about you know, how we try and identify these issues and what controls we've put in place in the last while to try and identify them before they become issues. Um, clearly it's a massive focus area for us, um, trying to do a whole lot more around complaints and to try and find the needle in the haystack that could be a systemic issue. You know, when you get many, many uh, customer complaints, sometimes I stood too long in the queue. 
um, you know, that's not a systemic issue, but it's still in the complaints data. So uh, we're doing a huge amount of work to try and find those <coughs> problems before they become uh, any worse. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Sherry. And Mr. Van Horen, if you were to make the assumption the Commissioner is talking about, that is, assume it's systemic unless proven otherwise, what would you do differently to what you do now? Um, we'd probably have armies of people, uh, you know, investigating multiple issues on a very broad front all the time. Um, and I'm not sure what, you know, we, we couldn't report it to a regulator. You wouldn't suddenly take action to, you know, close products for sale, which we've done in the past when we're not comfortable with the product. You, you couldn't do that until you had a, a confidence that there was, in fact, an issue. Thank you, It would you, be very difficult to, but it's something I'll think about, Commissioner, see if there's anything in that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Yes. Anything arising out of that, Mr. Dinelli? No. no. Mr. Van Horen, uh, be, be excused. Can be excused. Thank you, Mr. Van Horen. Uh, Your Honour, if we could have a couple of minutes and perhaps no more. I'll come back at quarter to four. Just to enable us to yes. move. Thank you.